Hope you all had a good week. Uh, it's Friday. It's almost the weekend. That's good news. Uh, we're going to finish up chapter 11 today. Forge ahead into chapter uh, 14. Numbers are jumping around a little bit here. Uh, we'll see what, see what we can get through today. Uh, just a reminder that all the homework dates should be correct now. There was uh, a few errors when they were posted initially, um, but it was not a typo that both homeworks 5 and 6 are due next week. Um, so hope you had an early start on that. A reminder, I know it's a lot of assignments in one week. You do get one dropped assignment, so just keep that in mind. Prioritize your work. I know you have a lot to do. Um, but those are both due next week. Hopefully, hopefully you got my email yesterday with a little extra help on some probability questions. It can be a little tricky. Those chapter 12 problems, so um, take a look at that. Let me know if you have any questions. I'd be happy to try to explain that more to you if you like. Uh, any, any questions you guys have on homework stuff or logistical stuff for the class or anything? All good? <clears throat> All right. So we're going to uh, finish up chapter 11 today here and just want, wanted to remind you a little bit uh, what we, sort of the main point of chapter uh, 11, which is we talked about this central limit theorem was that um, if, we have any, if we have any distribution of our, um, whatever variable we're looking at, whatever distribution that thing has, if, uh, if the sample size is large enough and if a few other conditions we have check out, then we, we know that the sample mean from our sample is going to approximately follow a normal distribution with the correct mean and the, and the standard deviation, which is sigma divided by the square root of n. And we, uh, um, a question was asked, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second, maybe. Um, but to, to be able to use this theorem, we, uh, we had to check a few conditions. So we had to make sure that the, the sample we were taking was random. We want to make sure to have a, a representative sample from our population. That's sort of the thing we always want to make sure about. Um, then we had, the, uh, had these two other conditions. So, so what we introduced on the, what the theorem states is that the sample size has to be large. So um, for this class, we're going to assume that, that the sample size, we want to make sure that it's at least 40 so that um, in the sample that we take and that we're calculating the sample mean from, we need to make sure that's at least 40 people or 40 individuals. And then we had sort of a, a theoretical thing that we didn't talk a whole lot about, but just to make sure that our sample is not too big. Um, so these conditions here have been termed um, the Goldilocks principle, um, which is a children's story for those of you who don't know about it. Just that we don't we want our sample to be not too big and not too small. We want it to be kind of just right. Um, so we just want to make sure that these these things hold, and then we're able to assume that our sample mean has a approximately normal distribution and we'll and we'll go from there. So this is kind of kind of the main ideas uh, from chapter the main idea from chapter 11. We did a few examples um, and wanted to finish up with one example and then we'll and then we'll move on. I didn't quite get through the last one there. Um, just do one more one more practice here for you. So for this example we're going to suppose that the tail of the honey badger has a mean mean length of 23 centimeters and a standard deviation of 2.33 centimeters. So I guess it's been a few years since the good old honey badger video, but uh, if anybody remembers that. <laughs> so the question that we have is, if, uh, if 40 honey badgers are randomly selected, would it be unusual for their average tail length to exceed 24 centimeters? So the question is phrased a little differently here, but still we're asking a question about um, the average tail length of these, of these 40 honey badgers. So we want to think about um, can we use sort of our, our usual tricks to, to answer this, this question? Um, so let's, here in this example, let's let x bar equal the average tail length of the 40 honey badgers. <clears throat> And now again, remember, if we want to use use our bag of tricks, we have to check we have to check some conditions. That's our, our first step here, is to check. And these are those three conditions that we had on that previous slide. So we want to see: Do we have a random sample 
uh, do we have a small enough sample? And do we have a large enough a large enough sample? So uh, again, as usual, we can do we have a random sample? Well, as is often the case, um, uh, well, wh what do you guys think? <laughs> do we have a random sample? Yes, we do, right? It says the, these 40 honey, ba honey badgers are randomly selected, so kind of think about this being a random sample. So yes, stated in the problem. Uh, secondly, do we have a small enough sample? So we want to make sure our sample is, is not more than, um, or that the population is at least 20 times bigger than, than our sample is, or that our sample is no more than 5%. So we take our sample size, 40, multiply it times 20, which is 800. So are there more than, uh, are there more than 800 honey badgers in the world? Probably we hope so anyway, right? We don't want them to be too endangered. They're pretty. They're pretty angry, so we would assume that there's a lot of them. So this is less than the total number of all honey badgers. So we're okay there. And what about our sample? Is our sample large enough here? Seeing some nods. <laughs> yes, it is, right? So n equals 40 is indeed at least is at least equal to 40. So we're good to go there. <clears throat> and so all three of our conditions have, have checked out. So quickly before I go on here, um, when you're doing homework problems or uh, anything involving these checking conditions, which we're gonna have um, somewhat frequently over the next number of chapters, some conditions to check to make sure we can use the methods we're looking at. Um, do not just write out the conditions and put a check mark. It's very important to kind of say, kind of write out what we've done here. Um, so don't just write out the condition, put a check mark, kind of say why the condition checks out. And it can be as simple as what we've written right here. So random sample, again, yes, is just stated in the problem. Um, give, give some reasoning instead of just putting, putting check marks here. So. So we want to make sure to give reasons not not just check off so again, something as simple as what we've done here is is totally fine um, but again, do make sure to give some justification for why why you're saying the conditions do check out Okay, so, so now again the question that we're interested in uh, is something about this average tail length. And because our conditions have checked out, um, we know uh, we can say that x bar is approximately normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma over the square root of n which is normal with mean uh, 23 centimeters and standard deviation 2.33 divided by the square root of 40. That's again, because the conditions checked out, the central limit theorem tells us that this distribution will be approximately normal and we can uh, go ahead and use our uh, usual bag of tricks to answer answer this question. So the question says, uh, would it be unusual for their tail length to exceed 24 centimeters? So again, we know that x bar here has a normal distribution centered at, it's my awesome normal curve, centered at 23. We want to know something about something about 24. So if I want to know if it's unusual for their tail lengths to exceed 24 centimeters, what probability would I want to find under the curve there? Smaller part, yes, exactly. I want to I want to know something about the tail lengths that exceed that exceed 24 centimeters. So what is what is that shaded in area there? And again, we'll do our usual thing. We'll find the z score. So z is now 
Um, it's x bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n, which is, uh, now we're interested in 24, subtract off the mean, divide by 2.33 with the square root of 40. And this number that you're going to get is 2.71. So we can fill that in down here on our, on our Z scale. Quickly interrupt, uh, this question just came in, is this from our chapter 11 guided notes? Uh, this is from a set of chapter 11 notes that was posted under just our just our lecture. So there's on Carmen. There's a in the content tab. Um, there's a section that says supplemental materials for Mark Risser's lecture, and it's it's under there under the incomplete or the semi-complete lecture notes. So that's the that's the set of notes we're using here. It's slightly different than maybe the ones that are posted in general. So sorry about that confusion. Anyway, back to our question. So uh, again. Is it unusual to, to have a tail length of greater than 24 centimeters? If we can figure out what the probability of that happening and then um, figure that out, that's kind of the direction we want to go. So um, finding the probability that the sample mean of these 40 honey badgers have a tail length of greater than 24, again, is equal to the probability that Z is greater than 2.71. So again, use your favorite method to find that, that small area up there at the, at the upper tail. Um, what I'll do is look up 2.71 in, in table A, and I find that this opposite area here is 0.9966, and that's coming from table A, the, the usual normal probability table that we've used all along here, skipping over kind of how we got there, um, but it would be good to check that you know how to find that number. So then the probability that we want here is equal to 1 minus 0.9966, which is 0 0.0034. Everyone okay on those calculations? Again, kind of doing what we did at the end of the lecture on Wednesday. So what this, what this tells me, again, in the, sort of in the context of the problem, is that the probability that the average tail length um, for, a horde, for 40 honey badgers, the probability that that's longer than 24 is 0 0.0034. So very, very small probability. So the question that we wanted to know is, uh, is it, un, or would it be, Would it be unusual for the average tail length Would it be unusual for that average tail length to exceed 24? That's the question we're asking. So what do you guys think? Yes, yes or no? Seeing some yeses, so uh, anybody have a want to tell me why that's it should be yes? Yes, exactly. So, so the probability the probability is so small. So, again, um, we found that the using our because we could use this approximation and find the probability of this of this happening, probability is tiny, right? So, a point zero zero three percent uh, probability is less than one percent of the time that should happen. So, so yes, definitely. And this is because. the probability of it happening is so small. So I think you guys had the intuition there, but again, we can say that's unusual because the probability that it happens is really, is really small. Is that okay with everybody? 
Uh, we can make that call. We can make that statement. Okay. So these are the these are the type of questions that you want to that you'll be needing to answer in in this chapter. Um, just just wanted to make a few concluding comments here. So we've looked at a few examples in this chapter. Remember, early in the chapter we looked at the the weights of adult Springer Spaniels, and then right at the end of class on Wednesday we looked at um, the average composite score in the ACT. And so keeping in mind what the difference here was, um, the key the key difference here is is uh, is that we have the distribution is approximately normal with mean. 52.5 and standard deviation 2.5. So that's the so here the population population distribution is normal. So back in that first example uh, when we had a normal population uh, we did not need to check any conditions. So in this case um, we do not So if the population distribution is normal, no need to check conditions. You can uh, kind of use the, well, what we saw was that the, the, um, the sample mean having a normal distribution was true, was true always when the population distribution is, is normal. Um, in the ACT example and in the example we just did, um, we're not told anything about the, the population distribution. So here, um, we don't know. So down here we didn't we didn't know the population distribution, and so this is where, in order to use those same calculations that we did, we need to make sure our conditions conditions check out, um, which will then allow us to know that the sample mean is um, has a normal distribution, and we can use those those probability calculations and all that all that good stuff. So here, here we do do need to check conditions. So everybody okay with the difference here? So again, depending on what, what we know the population distribution to be, we either um, can just proceed with our calculations or we need to check some conditions before we, before we do that. All right, and finally, um, so we've, in all of our examples so far, all three conditions have checked out. So what, what happens if, if a condition, what happens if one of the conditions is not met? Well, uh, so in this case, if one of the conditions is not met, then, then it's really probably not safe to use uh, the central limit theorem and assume that the sample mean has a normal dis distribution. Um, for the purpose of this class, you, you might certainly in, at some point have a case where one of the conditions doesn't check out. Um, but just sort of for, for practice, we'll want you to go ahead and do the calculations anyway, just to, just to make sure that it's, um, just to kind of see what the, the answer would give you. But in this case, um, what we'll want to do is make a note that we want to, um, make a note that we will proceed with caution. We always have lots of cautions in this class. <laughs> so again, if one of the conditions doesn't check out, say why it doesn't check out. So if my sample size is too small, or if uh, my population is too small, or if, or if I don't have a random sample, um, then we maybe maybe don't want to just blindly trust the results here, and we just say that we're, we can proceed with caution. The results might not be completely accurate, but we can say, see what they are anyway. Um, so just make a note that we will proceed with caution, or you can abbreviate that PWC. <laughs> a little shorthand for yourself. So again, kind of the one of the overall goals of this class is knowing when, um, knowing when use of statistics is good and when it's bad. And so, um, if we're violating conditions here, that's probably not the best way of using these techniques. Um, and just to make to make a note of that before you kind of blindly move on.
Uh, any final questions with uh, chapter 11 stuff here? So um, be be before we move on to chapter 14, I'm going to go back real quick to, uh, well, this, this example, for example. So what we're told here is that um, the honey badgers had this, this mean and this standard deviation. So here, this is mu, and here this is sigma. So um, Donna asked me the question at the end, so why, uh, I, I thought we said all along here that we don't know what mu is, right? We don't know what the population mean is. Uh, we don't know these information. So why are, why are we just assuming that, that it's true here? Um, that's kind of where we're going in chapter, in chapter 14. Um, here we've just assumed, assumed that we know what the mean is, but it's kind of just for um, kind of motivating purposes to kind of see how these things work and figure out what these probabilities would be um, and kind of figure out the properties of, of the sample mean to be able to go forward into the next chapter where we're going to go back to the more re reasonable situation where we don't actually know what mu is and how can we make a good guess of what that is. So if that felt confusing to you, it should have. Um, it's uh, kind, of, kind of cheating to say that we suppose that we do know what this is when we actually, when we actually don't. So that's kind of, that's kind of where, we're, where we're going now. <clears throat> so anyway, chapter, chapter 14, we're getting into, uh, it's titled The Basics of Confidence Intervals. Um, and so I, I sent around these notes last night. Um, they are also posted in the same place that the previous chapter 11 were under the supplemental materials for this class, under the semi-complete notes if you look there. So again, here what we're what we're going to be doing in this class, uh, again, putting this slide up here yet again, is that we kind of started out with exploring data, just, uh, exploring relationships, um, and now now we're into this section of the course called inference, which is we're taking information from our sample and generalizing it to our population of interest. And here we are. Um, so we're going to use the sample mean. to estimate the population mean. So that's kind of the, uh, continues to be our over, overall goal here. And now we're going to look at how we actually, actually go, about, go about doing this. Oh, <laughs> all right. So again, to estimate, to estimate the sample mean, to, to estimate the population mean mu, we're going to use the sample mean um, x bar. So that's kind of just the, the intuition that we have going, that we've been using here all, all along. Okay, so uh, just, a, just a question for you here, uh, and maybe I'll have you guys raise your hands, but just think about it. Um, what is the probability that the sample mean is exactly equal to the population mean? So is that probability zero? Uh, 0 0.5, is it 1, or is it something between 0 and 1, but we don't know what? Does anybody have any, any ideas here? Maybe I'll forgo the general poll. I know it's early. <laughs> well, let's, let's uh, think back to chapter 10. When we were looking at the... Uh, one of the examples we looked at was the prob or the how how early that one student Sean was to class. So he was going to be somewhere between five and fifteen minutes early to class, and we knew it had a we knew it had a uniform distribution, it was, uh, something like that. And we found probabilities that he'd be you know um, more than ten minutes early to class, or less than seven minutes, or we had some some different things we could figure out there. And then we ask the question, what's the probability that he is, for example, exactly, exactly seven minutes early to class? And um, remember when we have a, when we have a continuous, um, when we have a continuous uh, probability distribution like we did there and like we do with the sample mean, we have a normal distribution. Um, probability corresponds to area under the curve, right? So in all the examples we do, 
we find, we shade in an area under the normal curve, find that area, and that's our probability. Um, so up here, for example, the probability that x was equal to 7, where x was the number of minutes early he was, we needed to find the area of that, of that line um, under the curve. And of course, the, that line has, has area 0. So the probability that he was exactly 7 minutes early to class um, was 0. And that's, and that's true of any number. The probability that he's, he's exactly um, 13 minutes early to class. Um, probably that he's 4.2 minutes early to class. Um, because, because we have a continuous um, probability distribution where, it's, where our probability corresponds to area, the probability of something being exactly equal to a number is, is 0. So that's, that's, the same, that's the same idea here. Um, kind of in notation, this, this would be the probability that the sample mean x bar is equal to, to mu, which is just a, just a single number. So just like before, that's going to be, that's going to have a probability of 0. Which again is a very weird, it's a very weird thing. <laughs> that doesn't really, I think that's hard, hard to grasp, but uh, that is, again, that is true. Um, and just, yeah, so just to remind that when we have a continuous distribution, the, the probability corresponds to area. Um, so the picture you can think of is if I have a normal distribution here, this is x bar, here is, is my mean mu, even if I don't know what it is, the area kind of above that, above that point is there's, there's no area there. So that, that probability is equal to zero. So instead of, so kind of, uh, again, if we want to get something that does have positive area, we can kind of go on, go on either side. So if we, if we give a little bit of wiggle room on each side of, of what our estimate is, um, then we will get something that has the probability of actually happening. So instead of just, instead of saying the sample mean, the, the population mean we're guessing is ex exactly equal to the sample mean, we're going to give kind of a range of values to say, well, the population mean is probably somewhere in this, in this range of values. And that's um, what I mean by this, by this wiggle room. And then so we need to figure out how do we, how do we obtain, how do we say what that, what that wiggle room is. So again, this, this leads us to um, kind of, we're going to start out with a sort of a simple or artificial case. And if, if we have, uh, again, just to kind of motivate, motivate what we're talking about here. Um, so if we have these, these three simple conditions, if they're met, then we're, then we're, uh, we can do, say, say some things about how to find what this wiggle room is. Um, so kind of just in a hypothetical situation here, suppose that we have a simple random sample. Um, the variable we're measuring has exactly a normal distribution, so our population distribution is normal. And then again, we're trying to guess, we're trying to say something about the, the population mean mu. So again, here now we're saying we don't know what mu is, um, but for now we do know what, well, we do know what the standard deviation sigma is. So just, just as a quick check, uh, do, these, do these seem reasonable to you? And why, why or why not? So is it, is it reasonable to think that we might have a simple random sample? That's fine, right? I mean, we would certainly, again, it's not always going to happen, but um, we would hope that we, have a, that we have a simple random sample. So that, so that one's OK. Um, so, so one should be OK. Uh, but we do but we do need to check so if they if if you know if we're not told that there's a random sample kind of think about uh is this sample have a chance of being representative um and so that's kind of what we're what we're going for what about the second one um do you think it would it's likely that the variable we're looking at has exactly a normal distribution That seems a little bit more of a stretch, right? Um, even things that are uh, so so many of the things we we'll look at are, are not even close to being normal, like the the heights the heights example from the previous chapter. Again, uh, it's kind of a bimodal thing. If you're looking at uh, I don't know income, that's going to be really skewed, or house prices is going to be really skewed. Um, so it's it's rare that the that the population distribution.
is exactly is exactly normal. Which is why it's good that we have those methods that we talked about in chapter 11 so that we can still use these calculations even if even when number two is is not true. And finally, uh, what, what do you think? Uh, does, it, does it seem likely that we would we would not know what the population mean is, but that we would know what the standard deviation is? Again, that's kind of weird too, right? So um, three is, is kind of totally, this is totally ridiculous. <laughs> Um, we, we wouldn't expect to know what the standard deviation is sigma if we didn't know what, what mu was. So again, just to point out that uh, these conditions are not necessarily um, good or um, uh, likely to actually happen, but we're going to kind of start, start here and, and see what we can do and then, and then kind of come back and address these conditions later and, and kind of see if we can get rid of, get rid of these conditions that, um, that aren't really practical. So yes, yeah, so again, these kind of provide some good good motivation for for where we're going. Um, and there's a, just a reference to a page in your text if you want to read a little bit more about about kind of what we're what we're doing here. So as a, as a motivating example here, we're gonna we're gonna look at this example. So suppose the commute times back from 2011 follow a normal distribution with a standard deviation of 10 minutes. Uh, but again, we don't know what the we don't have any information about what the average. Um, the average commute time is here. So what we do is we take a random sample of 75 American workers and we we find that their average commute time was was 50 minutes. So let's pick out the information that we have. 10 is my standard deviation sigma. 75 is my sample size. And 50 this is my this is my sample mean x bar. All right. So again, kind of to build up our build up our intuition here, let's first think about um, what we would, what we could do here. So if we want to estimate this unknown population average commute time mu, again, if the first idea we're again we're always saying we're going to estimate the population mean with our sample mean. Uh, so first first crack is that we just straight up use x bar equals 50 to to um, estimate mean. So we we guess. Say we guess that mu is the same as x bar equals 50. So that's kind of that's kind of what we're doing here as a as a first guess. But like we said, um, we don't we don't expect that uh, that x bar will be exactly equal. To the population mean. Um, so, we want to kind of try to say how how good of a guess is that? Again, the probability that x bar equals the population mean is zero. So let's if we can somehow say how how good this this guess is, that would be that would be good. We want. So again, we don't expect x bar to be exactly equal to the to the population mean. Um, it should be close. That's the that's the that's what we learned back in chapter 11. Um, so we want to try to say how accurate this this guess is, or or make it, and then make it as accurate as as possible. So in order, in order to say how accurate this guess is or how to figure out um, how we can make this, this guess better, um, again, we're going to use the sampling distribution. So back in uh, chapter 11, um, again, because, because the population is normal and we have a And we have a simple random sample. We know that that the uh, average commute time for the 
we know that x bar, which is our average commute time, for 75 people, we know that this is, is normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma over square root of n, which is uh, normal. We'll leave the mu in there. We don't know what that is. But the other thing we can fill in, that's 10 divided by the square root of 75. So again, because the population is normal and we have a simple random sample, that's, that's OK there. Uh, we know that this average commute time for 75 people is going to have a, uh, a normal distribution here. And so this is going to kind of how we can use how we can say how accurate our, our, our guess is. So if you remember back to the uh, back to chapter three, we always go back to <laughs> that chapter, it seems like. Um, you remember the, the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, uh, which told us that, um, again, for, for a normal distribution, 95% of the area lies between plus and minus two standard deviations, right? So if we have a if we have a normal distribution up here, if we go up two standard, if this is our z score, if we go up two and down two, uh, there was 95 percent of the area we captured in there. So kind of the same idea for the sample mean. Um, we, we uh, again, if we want to give some wiggle room, instead of saying just a single number, if we give kind of a range of values, that'll, that'll be better. Um, sort of a reasonable thing to believe that um, sort of 95% of the time, the population mean will be within two standard deviations of the sample mean x bar. So again, remember the uh, x bar has, has standard deviation 10 over square root of 75 which is uh, 1.15. Um, so, so here we can say we would expect we would expect the population mean to lie within two standard deviations of our, of our sample mean. So we would expect mu to be within uh, two standard deviations, so two times 1.15, which is 2.3 minutes of the sample mean uh, x bar equals 50. So again, this is how we're kind of building in our, how, how can we sort of guess how much wiggle room we need on each side of our of our guess to have a better estimate of what the population mean is. So here that would be, uh, so what this is here is x bar minus 2.3, which is um, 47.7 minutes, and x bar plus 2.3. So we're going below two standard deviations and above two standard deviations. Um, So again, here what we have is we would expect the mean to lie within these two within these two numbers. So we would expect the mean to be somewhere between 47.7 and 52.3. And just to finish this off, uh, so what what we've just created here is is called a confidence interval. So again, interval means that we're giving a range of values as our estimate. And the confidence interval means that we'll be able to say sort of how confident we are in our, in our guess here. So, um, so this is, a, this is a, again, an, an interval. So the interval that we had was 47.7 up to 52.3 minutes. Um, and we, we, because we would sort of expect 95% of the time that our, our guess would fall between plus and minus two standard deviations, um, we can say we can say the following. So we can say that we are 95 we're 95 percent confident that the true 
that the true mean commute time for American workers again is in this interval so is between 47 0.7 and 52, 52.3 minutes. So again, we are 95% confident that the true mean commute time for American workers is between 47.7 and 52.3 minutes. So what we're doing here is we've given we've given a, we've given an interval. So we're we're guessing instead of just saying the population mean is maybe exactly equal to the to the sample mean of 50, we're saying that probably it's more likely that it would fall in this range of values, and then sort of putting a um, how how good is this guess? Well, we can say that we're sort of 95 percent confident um, because we went plus or minus two standard deviations there. So this is, a, this, is a, this is a very new idea, I'm sure. Uh, what, what questions can you guys think of on, on what's going on here? Is this, is this making some sense, what we're doing? OK, well, let's, again, let's, let's formalize, formalize what we've just done here. So again, what we just did was we created a, we created a confidence interval. We, gave a range of values, an interval of values as our guess for what the population mean is. And then we had some level of confidence attached to that, how, how good, how, how likely it was that the interval was going was to be correct. Um, and so a formal definition here is that a, a confidence interval has, has two parts. So first of all, it's, it's an interval which you calculate, calculate from the data, which is usually some estimate plus or minus some, some wiggle room. So plus or minus. Um, plus or minus a margin of error or kind of think about we're, we're giving a range of values instead of just one number. So we're going to take some estimate, we're going to add and subtract something, something to it. So that's, that's the first part, but then it also has uh, a confidence level, um, which uh, again, formally, it's well, what that means is it gives the probability that the interval will capture the correct value, the true parameter value, in repeated samples. So um, this is a this is a very confusing thing. Uh, it's very um, it's very often misinterpreted. But kind of think about it as a success rate for the method. So sort of 95% of the time, that interval would uh, would give us the correct correct number. So a confidence interval has two things. It's a it's an actual interval. So the estimate plus or minus something, and then we want to say how how confident we are in that in that interval. So this is this is where things get a little confusing, um, but uh, so so think about now what is the probability that the interval, forty-seven point seven to fifty-two point three minutes captures the population mean commute time for American workers. So is it five percent? Is it ninety-five percent? Or is it zero or one? We don't know which. So I'm going to actually have you put your hands up now. How many of you think it's a? It's uh, point point oh five. Okay. How about how about B? It's ninety-five point nine five. How many go with C? It's um, zero or one. Anybody want to take that one? It's too iffy, isn't it? So again, kind of another another mind blower for you here. The correct answer is actually is actually C. Um, so what? <laughs> again, so what I've done here is I've calculated an interval. So it's um, I have this number forty seven point seven to fifty two point three is my is my range here. Um, the population mean again is is an actual number, right? It's it's some it's some value. There's some average commute time for everybody out there, um, and and that's a that's a fixed number. So we don't know what it is, but it is it is a single number. And so um, we can't again we don't we don't know if it's in this interval or not. Um, but it either it either is or it isn't. So it's it's either in your interval in which the probability is one. Or it's it's not inside the interval, in which case the probability is zero. So we didn't we didn't catch the the true the true thing. Um, 
So the difference here, I'll go back, is is uh, is this this thing that I underlined earlier. So looking at any one particular confidence interval, I can't say anything about the probability. I can't say the probability that the mean is in this interval is 95 is 0.95. Um, this is this the confidence level talks more about a success rate. So if I were to do this, if I took uh, so here one sample I took, I got the confidence interval 47.7 to 52.3. If I took another sample, I would get a different um, sample mean, probably out of a slightly different confidence interval. So if I kept doing that over and over, um, it's kind of like a success rate. So 95% of those intervals that I calculated would, would create, would contain the true value. So if, uh, again, this is, this is pretty, this is kind of tricky, but just to, um, just to clarify that it is, it is not correct to say that there's some probability going on here. Um, the confidence level is not referring to a probability, it's referring to a success rate. Um, so the confidence level refers to a success rate, not a probability. So the reason that choice C is correct is because um, Mu is either between uh, 47.7 and 52.3, in which case uh, the probability would be one, or or it's not. So again, we don't know exactly what it is. If it is between, then the probability is one. If it's not, then the probability is zero. So again, we don't know what mu is. That's the whole point. And so, um, but it, but it is some it is some fixed value. So it's either in that interval or or it's not. So the confidence interval again is talking about a success rate. Oh, fantastic question just came in. So why do we use ninety five? Could we say that we are ninety nine point seven percent? that it falls within three standard deviations or 68% sure that it falls within one standard deviation? Absolutely. That is exactly correct. So that's a um, <laughs> brilliant question. That's right where we're going, where we're going next. Um, so that kind of reiterates what I, what I just said here. Um, but so, so 95 was just a number that I arbitrarily picked here, right? So we maybe, maybe we're interested in 99.7% confidence or 68% confidence. Um, so we can have we can have different levels of confidence, and yes, we will want to go a certain number of standard deviations away from from the mean here. Um, just a quick note that uh, again, if we if we want 95% confidence, we don't need to go a full two uh, standard deviations away. We just need to go 1.96, which is very close, but it's not it's not quite the not quite the same. Um, but then, but then the confidence level can can be any any number that we're interested in. So if we want, just like it came in, if we want a 68% confidence, we'd only have to go plus or minus one standard deviation. If we want a lot more, we could go three standard deviations away. Um, but the point is that we can we can go uh, we can go any 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 number of standard deviations away to get various degrees of confidence. Um, so this leads us to the idea of of what's called a critical value. Which gives us, um, which we're going to call z star, um, which will give us, which is a z score corresponding to some some range of probability under the uh, under the standard normal curve. So that if we want again 68% confidence, z star would be would be one. If we want a 99.7 confidence again, um, like the comment said, we could do three standard deviations. <coughs> Uh, but sort of, sort of, there, there's sort of a, so again, you could have any, co any level of confidence that you wanted, anywhere from zero, zero up to one. Um, but most often we'll use, we'll use sort of three, three standard confidence levels. We'll either do 90%, 95%, or, or one point, uh, or, or 99%. So again, uh, these numbers come from the fact that in a normal distribution, if I go, if I go up here to 1.645, and down here to negative 1.645, I'm going to have 90% of my area in the middle there. 
And uh, similarly up here, if I go between 1.96 and negative 1.96, I'm going to have 95% of my of my area is contained in there. And if I go all the way out to 2.576 and negative 2.576, I have 99% confidence. So again, you can pick any number you can pick any number you want, but uh, these are kind of going to be your standard, your standard go-tos for, um, for what my confidence level is. And so then my critical value is going to be, it's going to be these, these, numbers, these numbers here. So before we used, in that first example, we used 2 as our critical value. We went two standard deviations on either side. Um, and actually, we only need to go 1.96. So uh, again, using our critical values here now, we can, we can kind of give ourselves a general formula for what our confidence interval is. Um, so here's, here's uh, the general formula that we've been kind of building up to in this whole, in this whole discussion. Uh, and then if we have a, a, a kind of keeping with our sort of unrealistic assumptions here, if we have a simple random sample of size n um, from some normal population with an unknown mean and a standard deviation sigma, our level C confidence interval is going to be is going to be the following. So here we have the estimate plus or minus some margin um, margin of error. So margin and here we're actually writing down now what what that is. So our estimate again is is x bar as a sample mean. Um, our margin of error is whatever our critical value is. So this is our And then uh, multiply that times times the standard deviation of x bar. All right, that was a lot of information. Uh, what what questions do you guys have on on what's going on here? Yeah. Yes, exa exactly right. But you would want it. You want it, but also multiply on the the um, this this part here. So, but but yes, that's exactly right. So, so for example, if we wanted um, going back to the commute time example, um, going back to the commute time example, we had our x bar was equal to 50. Uh, sigma over the square root of n was 1.15. So if we wanted a 99% confidence interval there, or, well, let's go with a 90%, like you said, um, then we would take uh, x bar minus, um, if we want 90%, then we'll have 1.645, 1.645 times 1.15, which is 50 minus 1.645 times and then we would also add that on. We take x bar plus 1.645 times 1.15. So can anyone quickly punch those into their calculator for me? I guess I could maybe do the same. Oh no. Trying to go too fast here. 50 plus. Well, failing at the order of operations here on my iPhone. <laughs> so this is about 51.9. And this is about uh, 40. 8.1. So then we would say that our, so then here, 
a 90% confidence interval uh, would be 48.1 to 51.9. So again, kind of whatever, whatever confidence level we want, so be it 90%, 99%, whatever. Um, it's kind of, this is the formula that you want to use. And again, the, pretty much the only thing that's changing there is the, is the Z star value. So does that make sense, Alyssa? What? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm out of time. Uh, so you guys should get out of here. Have a great weekend. Uh, we'll pick back up with this discussion on, uh, on Wednesday. Have a good weekend. Thank you.